Good morning, church. It is good to see you on this beautiful Lord's Day. I was handed a note here. I'm going to uh, share this with you. Um, you know, sometimes you get so much on your plate that you, when you get a note, you forget to read the note. You know? um, it says, the Colette family would like to extend gratitude to our church family for your support during our time of grief. We appreciate the outpouring of love and your concern for our well-being. We also appreciate the food from the church and especially your prayers. We're so blessed of God to have such a wonderful church family. And that's from Linda Bodenhammer on behalf of uh, her family. Of course, we continue to remember them and the Putnam family in our prayers. God will comfort them. You know, many times after the funeral, everybody else goes back to their normal life. And if you're the one that lost a loved one, life never goes back to the way it used to be. So we continue to pray for them. This morning, I have a couple things to share with you. Uh, Libby has asked me to share that the uh, Get Fit is today. It will be today. Okay? And it's in your bulletin, but it's generally the first Sunday of the month, but it is today. And then secondly, it's not in your board. And that is, we're going to have a called church council meeting this afternoon at 4.30. So if you're on the council, if you'd be here about 30 minutes before church starts, uh, we have uh, one or two items that we need to take care of today. And then also have uh, something that uh, I shared with the church Wednesday. I went out on a limb. I've been staying out on that limb until God tells me different. And that is, I have some good news, and that is, uh, God willing, we will dedicate our new sanctuary to the Lord on May the 20th at 3 p.m. God willing, that's what we do. Now, I have been given various dates in the past by the general contractor, and obviously we haven't met those dates. But uh, he didn't give me this date, I gave him this day. Okay? And uh, a part of that is a couple of reasons. I'm going to share that with you. And that is uh, looking at our calendar, if we didn't do it then, it would be July or August because of all the other things that are on our church calendar. And so uh, we're this close. To, uh, get on the ball, get her done. Right? <clears throat> but here was the thing that really, when I looked at May the 20th, that I had one of those uh, aha moments. Is May the 20th, this year, is Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost is when the power and the presence of God fell on the church. I can't think of a better time to move into the new sanctuary and dedicate it to the glory of God on the day that we celebrate when the power and the presence of God fell on the church. I believe that's God's day. Okay? <clears throat> now, with that in mind, that's the good news. Here's the bad news. In our new facilities, there'll be no food or drink. Okay? All you have to do is walk, walk around the facilities we have now. You can see the stains in the carpet. And so we're going to have plenty of place over here to eat and drink. We have this building, that building, that building. But in our new building, we want it to be a holy, sacred place. We want it to be different than all the other places. You know, we want it to be a holy ground, so I'm just going to say this from now to the time we get in it, and you build it, we'll have no food and drink. And again, the purpose for that is, is to honor God having a holy place that we have set aside to glorify and to worship Him. So I hope you will uh, help spread the word that on the 20th of May, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we're going to dedicate new sanctuary to the glory of God. If you look inside your bulletin, you'll find one of these. It's a connection card. I hope you'll take a moment, fill out the front side. On the back side, there's a place to write down your prayer concerns. I hope you'll write those down. When the offering plate comes around, I hope you'll put those in uh, in there. The ushers will bring them up. We will pray over these at the end of the service and make a prayer list to hand out to the church on Wednesday. For those that are visiting with us, please fill out your connection card. Hold on to it. And at the end of the service, if you'll come over here to the hospitality table and bring me yours, I will turn it in so it is prayed over. And uh, I have a gift and an information packet that I'd like to give you. This time, I'm going to ask God's favor and blessings upon our gathering. If you 
join your heart with mine as we pray. Heavenly Father, we believe that this is the day that you have made. God, we will rejoice and be glad in it. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Holy Spirit, may you rain down on this place today. God, may you move on hearts and lives. May we magnify and glorify Jesus Christ in all we say and all we do. Father, may our worship be pleasing and acceptable unto you. Make, make our prayer in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.
That's our purpose in life is to honor, to glorify Him in all we say and all we do. Reading God's Word, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Let us pray. Father God, we pray for you this morning. We thank you, God, for such a beautiful Lord today. Thank you. Lord, we thank you.
wrote to the Romans in chapter 8, verse 31, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And then he wrote to the church at Ephesus, chapter 1, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms, with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love He predestined us to be adopted as His sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will to the praise of His glorious grace which He has freely given us in the one He loves. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Let us pray. Gracious God, may we see today that You are great enough to bless us and that God did you graciously give us all things. Help us, God, to take hold of every spiritual blessing that we have in Christ Jesus. We'll make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. How are you doing today? I heard good. I heard wonderful. Blessed. Well, when folks ask me, they say, how are you doing? I never say I'm doing good. I never say I'm doing fine. I never say I'm having a wonderful day. If people ask, how are you doing? I say, I am blessed. And I say that because I'd rather be blessed by God any day than be good or fine or wonderful. So my question to you today is as we think about God is great enough to bless me, do you want God to bless you? Let me ask you because I didn't hear anybody say this. Do you want God to bless you? Yes. I just try that one more time. Do you want God to bless you? Yes. Is He great enough to bless you? Yes. In the valley is He great enough to bless you? Yes. On the mountaintop, is He great enough to bless you? Yes. Listen, God is so interested in blessing you that the word blessed, which means happy, to be envied, to be desired. People ought to want to be like you when you're blessed. The Bible mentions this 544 times in 484 different verses. I said, how many times does God have to say He wants to bless you until we get it? God desires to bless His people. And when we talk about blessing, we're meaning to speak good into somebody's life or to do good things for others. Do you want God to speak good things into your life? Do you want God to do good things in your life? Then you desire... God's blessings. And so I want us to begin by looking at four different types of blessings that the Scriptures speak about. The first one that I'd like to mention is the blessing that God speaks to His people. Genesis 12, 2, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. God made this promise to Abraham. What did He promise him? What? I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bless you so much that you're going to bless other people by my blessing upon your life. God made that promise 3,800 years ago, and God is still honoring that promise of blessing today. 
When he said, I'm going to bless you and bless all nations through you, he was referring to sending the Savior, sending the Messiah, sending Jesus Christ. Okay? Today, currently, 2.2 billion people in the world identify themselves as Christians. Over 2 billion people say, I have been blessed by trusting Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. In the same way that God blessed Abraham, God wants to bless you. Do you want God's blessing on your life? Well, Abraham did. And he received it. And then there's a second type of blessing I want to mention to you. And that is the blessing spoken by people to God. Now if this gets a hold of your heart, it will just uh, revolutionize your thinking. You can bless the heart of God. Notice here what it says in Psalm 103 verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is in me, bless His holy name. <coughs> bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of His benefits. I mean, we recognize this morning that God, the creator and sustainer of the universe, can bless you. But how can you possibly bless Him? The one who made it all, the one who has it all, how do you bless Him? And yet the Word of God says you and I can bless God. How do you bless somebody that has it all? Well, it's easy. It's simple. You give Him your praise and your honor and your glory. Not long ago, one of the men in my church just randomly started bragging on one of my sons. And he's talking about what a good, good uh, young man that he was, and uh, he was a hard worker, and how he was an inspiration. And, and let me tell you what: when he said all of those things about my son, you know what he did? He blessed me. Man, I walked away from there, and I was so proud. I was so happy. Well, don't you understand that when you praise God's Son, it blesses the heart of God. To think about it, that I can bless the Creator of the universe by simply giving praise to His Son. I bless the heart of God. Let me ask you this morning, do you want to bless the heart of God? Then honor and glorify and praise His Son. And then number three, there's a third type of blessing. And that is the blessing spoken by God to things. That is, God blesses things, just not people. In Deuteronomy 28, verse 4 and 5, The fruit of your womb will be blessed, and the crops of your land, and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds, and the lambs of your flocks. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. Now think about it. These folks are what? They're farmers. They're ranchers. And what does God say? God says, I will bless your farm. I'm going to bless your ranch. I'm going to bless you with children. I'm going to bless you with food. What's God talking about? He's going to bless things in your life. Ken Blanchard is a leadership management guru. His one book... He's written many, many books, but his one book, The One Minute Manager, has sold 13 million copies, okay? Think about that. If he just gets a 50 cent royalty off of every book, uh, you know, that's uh, six and a half million dollars off of that one book. But he has sought all around the world for his leadership and management skills. And the company that Ken Blanchard runs, get this, did you know his company gives a tithe of everything the company makes? And he allows each employee to designate up to $4,000 of where that tithe will go. Think about it. Here is a successful businessman that is sought out by all of the world. This is not a Baptist preacher. And what does he teach? He teaches that God will bless you. God will bless your business. God will bless your possessions. God will bless you materially if you do things that God asks you to do. God blesses things. 
I don't know about you, but I want God to bless the things in my life. Don't you? And then number four. A fourth type of blessing mentioned in the Bible is the blessing spoken from one person to another person. In Genesis 47, verse 7, Then Joseph brought his father Jacob in and presented him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. All right now, who is Jacob? He is a Jew. Who is Pharaoh? He is an Arab Gentile ruler. And what does Jacob do? Jacob blesses Pharaoh. Pharaoh is the most powerful man in all of the world. And here is Jacob, just a Jewish farmer, living in a famished nation. And what did he do? He blessed Pharaoh. Did you know that you and I can bless other people with our words? You and I have the ability to bless other people or to curse other people with our words. In our words is the power of life and the power of death. So let me ask you something. Are you blessing people with your words? Are you cursing people with your words? Here's an amazing statistic. 90% of people in prison today were told as a child, one day you'll end up in prison. Let me tell you what happened. They cursed that person with their words. Instead of saying, you're going to grow up and do something awesome from God, you're going to grow up and be a curse to society. You see, we either bless or we curse with our words. Who are you blessing? Who do you want to bless with your words? I got a pastor friend of mine. He's traveled all around the world. And he says one of the most unique places that he's ever been as a Christian is South Africa. And he said his experience in the South African churches that he's been in is they will come around and they use this expression, uh, I want to I speak a word of blessing into your life. Or they'll say, oh, I want to bless you. Well, what would happen if everybody in this room today became that kind of person? And that is, I want to bless other people. I want to be a blessing, and I want to bless them with my words. How could we change our community? How could we change our world if we just spoke words of blessing instead of words of curse? So here are the four types of blessings, but I want us to focus on today that God is great enough to bless you. Notice here, number one, God chooses to bless us. That is, it's God's desire. God wants to bless you. Mark, Peggy, I see you got your little grandson sitting there with you. Do you want to bless that little fellow? Do you think you want to bless him more than God wants to bless you? Oh, no. I want you to know, as much as you love Him, God loves you all more. And God desires to bless you, just like you desire to bless Him. Notice here what it says in Deuteronomy. And I want you to circle the word if. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all of His commands, I give you today, the Lord your God will set high above, set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You see there that God wants to, God desires to bless His people. He said, if you do this, if you obey me, then all, not some, all, of these blessings will be upon you. You need to know today that God is not mad at you. God is mad about you. God is not angry with you. God loves you. God desires to bless you. That's what God wants to do. God wants to bless you a lot. But notice there's some ifs. There's some conditions to it. But God's desires to bless you. Several years ago when my kids were small, they were into dirt bikes and four wheelers and, and, and getting in the mud and riding out in the woods and all that kind of stuff. And one day we go down to the Honda store and we're just browsing around and the salesman come out and said, oh, we got a new special edition Honda motocross bike. It's a special edition. They only made a hundred of these, only two in every state, and we have one of them. 
And my son went over there and his eyes got big as sewer leaves. Wow. Wow. And he's looking over that. And then the salesman says, hey, we got a track out back. Would you like to ride it? He said, Dad, can I? I said, yeah, go ahead. When he gets out there on that dirt bike, he goes a couple of rounds, he comes back in, and you can't wipe the grin off his face. Okay? And he doesn't say, Dad, can I have one? But the look on his face, it's like, you know what, if I can make this happen, that boy's going to have one of those. And so I went over there and I said, you know, how much is that? And he said, well, you know, there's only a hundred of them ever made. This is a special edition. I'll have to go see. And he comes back and he gives me this price tag. And then my eyes got about that big. <laughs> and I swallowed really hard. And here's what I said to myself. Self, I'd love to be able to do that when I don't have the resources to do it. Can I tell you something today? God has the desire to bless you and God is not limited by the resources. We serve such a big God, such an awesome God, such a great God. God is not limited by the resources that He possesses. Everything in heaven and earth and the universe belongs to Him. And God desires to bless you. And He has no limitation to His resources. Second, we choose to receive God's blessings by our obedience. Verse 15 in that same chapter, however, you see however, pay attention. However, if, there's that word if again, circle it. If you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all of His commands and decrees I'm giving you today, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. See, God desires to bless you, but what you and I have to do is we have to choose to receive the blessings of God. James, if I had you a gift and I wanted to give you that gift and you'd say, oh, oh no, Pastor, I can never accept that gift. It wouldn't do you any good that I desire to bless you. You see, we have to choose to receive God's blessings. I'm reminded of a Christian salesman. He's a car salesman. I know that sounds like an oxymoron, Christian car salesman, but they're out there. They're out there. You just have to look for them. But he had been to church and he heard a sermon on the golden rule. You know what the golden rule is? That's in the Sermon on the Mount. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto yourself. And so he's there at the car lot and uh, the dealership and and a Iranian foreign exchange student comes in and he sits down and he says, you know what, I'm going to treat this guy the way I'd like to be treated. He applies the golden rule. The guy, he helps him out, gets him a car. And after they have finished doing all that, he says, well, I want to thank you for how you've treated me today. I started out at the dealership across the street, but they treated me uh, disrespectfully. They were mean. They were rude. And so I came over here. And I want to thank you for taking care of my needs. He's why I'm glad to. Three years later, this Iranian foreign exchange student graduated from college and became the purchasing agent of a large construction company in Iran. And he calls the dealership that he bought his car at when he was a college student and said, I want to speak to salesman so-and-so. I will not speak to anybody else except to him. So they went out there and paged him, got him on the phone. He said, I want to place an order with you. He said, all right, I'll be glad to take your order. He said, I want to order 350 Super Duty pickup trucks. I want to order 750 heavy duty dump trucks. Now, folks, I don't know how much commission salesmen get, but I guarantee you who was the salesman of the month. Okay? I guarantee you that whatever his commission was off of 1,100 trucks was the biggest he ever got. And here's what I want you to see. Because he lived by God's principles, the golden rule, God blessed him and rewarded him for being obedient, doing life the way God said to do life. 
Notice when he was good to that student, that everybody else was disrespectful because of his race, because of his ethnicity, because of the country he was from, because this guy did the right thing, he had a blessing from God. The blessing wasn't that day, it was three years later. See, if you obey God, that doesn't mean that you're going to get a raise tomorrow. If you obey God, that doesn't mean your bank account's going to grow tomorrow. That means if you trust God, God will bless you. But you have to obey Him. I want to give you some basic uh, blessing, <coughs> blessing basics, based upon the prophet Malachi. And I hope you'll be receptive to what God wants to say to you on this matter today. Notice here, we are responsible to do our part. If you want God to bless you, there's a part you must do. Notice here, Malachi 3.10. Bring the whole tithe into the <coughs> storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if, there's that word, if, again. See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven, and pour out so much blessing, you will not have room enough for it. You see what's going on here? God says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you in ways you can't even imagine. If, if you do something. It's called if and then promise. If you do this, then God is going to do that. You and I have to do our part in order to be blessed by God. We just can't say, bless me, bless me, bless me, and live like devils. We can't do it. We got to do life the way God says. If you do it this way, then this is what will happen. I got a thing in, in the mail from Sears. Sears and Ropa. And it said, free. Free. 18 months free financing. Do you understand what Sears said? Sears said you can use our money for free. And they had a little asterisk. Beside. That little star. And that little aspect means go down to the bottom and read the fine print. And down at the bottom in the fine print, here's what it says. 18 months free rent, uh, free interest if you pay it off in 18 months. And if you have no late payments. <coughs> if you don't do this, the interest will be 29%. Do you understand what Sears is saying? Sears is saying, you can use our money free, or you can use our money and it's going to cost you 29% of your money. However it turns out, it's going to be up to what you choose to do. If you do it this way, it's free. If you do it the other way, it's going to cost you. You know, that's the way it is with God's blessing. If you do it God's way, God says, I'm going to bless you. If you don't do it God's way, guess what? It's going to cost you. It always costs you to disobey God. <clears throat> Second, we are to recognize God's right in our lives. God is the creator of the universe. God created you. God is the master of the universe. He is the Lord of lords. He is the King of kings. He is not your bailout. He is the master of the universe. And as such, there are rights that He has. Notice here, one of those in Leviticus 27, 30. <coughs> A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. You understand the whole point of the tithe is that God is saying certain things belong to me. Certain things belong to me. And those things are holy. I wonder how many of you recognized a while ago when the offering plate came around and you put your tithe in there that what you did was holy and what you gave was holy unto God. 
You see, one of the things that I greatly appreciate about going to Israel, going to the Holy Land, is I came back with an idea that some things are sacred and some things are holy. Some things are profane, some things are common, some things are worldly, but some things are holy. And let me tell you what makes something holy is God's hand and God's touch upon it is what makes it holy. See, in America, we don't have any sacred stuff. We don't have any holy stuff. And see, that's one of the things that I want to see happen when we go into new sanctuary. You will notice I have never called this a sanctuary. I've always called it a worship center. We've got basketball, volleyball courts made into here. We eat here. We drink here. We fellowship here. But a sanctuary means it is set apart as something holy to God. The tithe is holy unto God. I want to ask you something. When God, put, when God put Adam and Eve in the garden, what did He give them? He gave them everything but one tree. Everything. Everything in paradise. God gave to Adam and Eve except one tree. And what did God say? God said, that's my tree. Don't touch that tree. You can touch a million trees, but that one tree is mine. And what did Adam and Eve choose to do? They, they said, no God, we want what's yours. No God, we're not going to do it your way. We want it all. We want more. Let me ask you, when they took what didn't belong to them, when they took what belonged to God, did they end up with less or more? They ended up with less. Why? Now they don't have the blessing of God. They have the curse of God. Do you understand that some things are holy? Some things belong to God. And you need to keep your hands off of what belongs to God. I'm reminded of these kids. They were at camp. They're having a devotion. And the counselor says, God made everything. Amen. And everything that God made is good. Amen. And one little kid raised his hand and he said, Sir, well, why did God make poison ivy? What good can come from poison ivy? But the counselor was stumped. He didn't know how he was going to answer that. One of the other kids spoke up. He said, Oh, that's easy. God's trying to tell you there's some things you ought to keep your cotton picking hands off of. <laughs> right? Amen? Right? And what's one of the things you ought to keep your cotton picking hands off of? That which is holy. And what does God say is holy? God says His Word is holy. God says His people are holy. God says this day is holy. God says the tithe is holy. So what am I supposed to do? Keep my hands off. Did you, did you hear about the couple up in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania got arrested? They got arrested because they wouldn't pay the, the tip on the bill. It was an 18% gratuity added to their bill. And they said, we got lousy service and we're not going to pay the tip. Well, the establishment called the police and the police arrested them. An 18% gratuity. You see, on the menu it says an 18% gratuity will be added to every ticket. So it's printed in the menu. You order it with the understanding they're going to do that. And they said, no, we're not going to do it. So what happened? They got arrested. Now I want you to think about that. God only asked for 10%. The restaurant asked for 18%. When you didn't pay your 18%, the restaurant had you arrested. What would happen if God started arresting people who didn't give the tithe back to God? There'd be a lot of people in jail. There's some things y'all keep your God picking hands off of. And if you need to recognize that God is the master of the universe and He has a right to certain things. Notice here what it says in Malachi 3. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. God says, I want you to come back to me. Well, how would you think you'd come back to God? Well, I'd come back to God with prayer. I'd come back to God with fasting. I'd come back to God with Bible study. God says, no, you're going to come back to me and give me. I don't know about you, but that would have been my answer. 
How do I return to God? God says in giving. Now, why does God put so much emphasis on this? The Bible says where your treasure is, there is your heart also. You understand God's not interested in your pocketbook. God's interested in your heart. And where your treasure is, there's your heart. God wants your heart. He has a right as the creator of the universe to your heart. Sometimes people get it all confused. One fellow came up and he said to his pastor, I'm going to start withholding my tithe. The preacher said, why are you telling me? He said, well, who am I supposed to tell if I don't tell you? He said, well, just get right down here on your knees right now and say, God, I have decided to steal from you. He said, no, no, I'm not going to tell God that. He said, well, that's what you're doing and that's who you should tell. You need to understand that God has a right as your Savior and as your Lord, you have been bought with a price and God has a right to demand certain things from His people. <clears throat> Number three, we are to release God's blessings upon us. When I obey God and I trust God, I release the blessings of God on my life. Verse 10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. There may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing you will not have room enough for it. All right, now look up here at me. If you don't hear anything I've said all day, I want you to get this part right here. God says, you're robbing me. How do you rob God? I mean, he's the creator of the universe. I mean, that's like saying, hey, I broke in Rambo's house and stole from him. Huh? I mean, how do you rob Chuck Norris? You understand what I'm saying? I mean, these are big bad people. You don't mess with Leroy Brown. Okay? So how does somebody rob from God? If God is great and God is powerful, how do you take something from God? If you thought about that, that's pretty profound. And here's the answer. You rob God of the opportunity to bless you. You understand you're not robbing God of money. You're not robbing God of honor and glory. You're not honor robbing God of praise. What you're robbing God is, you're robbing God of the opportunity to bless you. You see, God has a desire. God wants to bless you. God is great enough to bless you. But God can only bless you if you let Him. And when you do certain things, you tie the hand of God and you rob God from blessing you. What do you have to do? It's oh, Him, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. Trust God that He is great enough to supply your need. Trust God that He's great enough to bless you and obey what God tells you to do and you will enjoy the blessings of God. Amen. Folks, it is that simple. The Bible says when we do that, God's going to open up the floodgates of heaven. He's going to pour out what? Over your home, there's going to be joy and happiness. Anybody like to have some joy and happiness in their home? God wants to bless you. Over your mind, there is peace and comfort. Would you like to have peace of mind? Comfort of mind. And then over your soul, there is contentment. Trust and obey. We started off asking, do you want God to bless you? All right, first of all, do you trust Him? Is He great enough to do it? And then secondly, will you obey Him? Will you do what God says to do? And folks, this is real simple. God's been speaking to some of you. God's been asking you to do some things. He's been asking some of you to give up your hurt and your habits and your hang-ups. God says, you're going to need to give those things up for me to bless you. God is saying, for some of you, you're going to have to quit uh, trying to fix this yourself. You're going to have to trust me to bless you. God is asking some of you to step out in faith and to trust God for ministry and for service. God's saying, I want to open up the floodgates of heaven. I want to pour out my blessings on you. I'm waiting on you. Is God great enough to bless you? He is. <laughs> Will you choose to receive the blessings of God? I want to close with a true story from history. A 
guy by the name of August Frank started an orphanage in Switzerland. Things were going good. The economy went downhill. Money got tight. Things got hard. And August Frank was down to his last gold coin. Had all these little children to feed. One day there's a knock at the door. It's a poor old widow woman. And she said, Sir, I've come here and I'm, I, I, as a last resort, I don't know where else to go. Sir, is there any way you can help me? And he looked at her and said, Ma'am, I've got this orphanage here. I've got all these little children to feed. I only have one gold coin to my name. I would love to help you. I just do not have the resources. She said, well, thank you. She went out there and sat down on the porch and began to weep and cry because she had no other place to go. August Frank went back there into his prayer closet, his war room, and he began to pray for that woman. He said, God, my heart is broke that that poor widow, she has no place to go. And God, she has asked for my help and I have nothing except this one point. I have nothing to help her with. And the Spirit of the living God came upon this man and he said, you do have something to help her with. You have that one gold coin. He said, August, will you trust me with that one gold coin? Will you go out there and give it to that poor old widow and trust me to take care of you in this orphanage? He said, God, I will. He went out there and told that woman, said, God spoke to me, told me to give this to you. Here it is in the name of Jesus. Go and be blessed. It's all I have. All I have, I give you. She got up, cried, hooked his neck, thanked him, went on the way. The next day, without a penny to feed any of these children, a wealthy Swiss woman knocked on the door and said, Mr. Frank, God has told me to come by and to give you this and handed him 12 gold coins. That afternoon, she, he went to the mailbox and there was a letter that had come out of the country. Guess what? There were two gold coins in that envelope. He'd given one and God had given him back 14. It gets better. Two days later, the prince of Switzerland, Ludwig von Wurttemberg, I had to write it down, the prince of Switzerland died and in his will he left August Frank in his orphanage 500 gold coins. Do you understand what happened? God said to August Frank, give away your last dime to this poor widow and trust me and I will bless you. And he stepped out in faith, obeyed God, trusted God, and in a week's time God multiplied it 500 hundred and fourteen times what he gave to God. Folks, you and I can't now give God. I asked you at the beginning, you want God to bless you? You want God to bless your marriage? You want God to bless your family? You want God to bless your career? You want God to bless your life? God says, I will pour out so much blessing you will not have room enough for it if will you come today and choose Will you come today and choose God's blessing? Would you say, God, I'm going to give you the right place in my life. I'm going to make you Lord of my life. I'm going to submit my life to your life. I trust you, God. And as I trust you and I obey you, I believe, God, you will bless my situation. <laughs> you would bow your head as we go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your promises. I thank you, God, that you're more willing to give than we are to obey. But Lord, as we have this time of invitation, God, help us to trust and obey. Lord, help us to realize that Your way is the best way. That You love us. That You are a great God. You are a good God. And You desire to bless Your children. Lord, if there's anyone here today that's not one of Your children, may they step out and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. <coughs> Lord, if there's somebody as far away, may they come up close to you to rededicate their life. God, for all the needs that are represented in this room today, may we come and trust the great God who desires to bless His people. 
And then God bless us that we might be a blessing to others. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Go ahead, please stand as we sing. We invite you to come. Thank you enough for all your benefits that you've given to me. 